Brad Jarrett, who is a two-time NASCAR champion, also has a wheel on the Walk of Fame in downtown Mooresville. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're very well, honored to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I was uh, reading that you started driving your dad's car at the age of nine. Yeah. So <laughs> you, so you, you were young behind the wheel. Maybe you could just take us through a little bit about you know when you got inspired to get into racing and some of the highlights of your career. Well, I was very fortunate, really. I grew up in a family of six children, mm -hmm. and uh, I was sort of in the middle of them, and my dad would let me drive to Sunday school when I was nine years old, That's and amazing. my older brothers, uh, they were a little bit jealous about it, but uh, <laughs> they didn't get to start until they were about 15 years old mm -hmm. driving. But when they started building the Hickory Speedway in uh, Hickory, North Carolina, mm -hmm. I started my career there, the first race that was ever run on that racetrack was the first race that I drove in. Wow. It didn't start as uh, thinking that it might be a career. Mm -hmm. It was just something to have some fun on a weekend. Mm -hmm. I thought I had a little athletic ability. I played some baseball and basketball in high school, but was not good enough at either of those to excel to any degree. So mm -hmm. I said, hey, racing. I grew up on a farm and working at a sawmill and was around machinery and equipment and learned to drive at an early age. So, so I thought, well, you know, that might be something that I could do and, and enjoy. And, and sure enough, it, it sort of stuck. Yeah, I, yeah, you clearly excelled at it. Now, how has it changed, though, from when you got started? You started in uh, New Hickory Speedway. Now, how has it changed over the years for you? And well, first of all, those were 1937 through 1940 Ford Coupes that okay. we raced in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the car part has changed dramatically mm -hmm. over the years. And one thing that I feel that has helped the sport to grow as much as it has is the fact that they've kept the cars so that at least you can identify them, whether mm -hmm. a Ford or Chevrolet or Pontiac or whatever the, the brand name might be. And uh, although they're far from stock, mm -hmm. uh, the cars back in my day were pretty stock. We didn't we're not allowed to do a lot to the cars uh, other than uh, things to make them safer. Mm -hmm. and, but many times uh, the things that you can do to make them safer actually will make them go faster. Yeah. Oh, and, really? uh, especially yeah. as far as the handling qualities mm -hmm. and the right. chassis uh, of the cars. And so it uh, has changed dramatically in that way as far as cars are concerned and of course uh, the amount of money that flows through the sport now. Well, that's interesting to you, point you. I saw you. You actually spoke at a People's Bank ribbon cutting not too long ago, and you mentioned you've been with them for a long time because they were the only bank that would sponsor you or loan yeah. you money. Because car racing back then was yeah. like, I don't know, it's like a black hole. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've been with People's Bank, uh, a customer of theirs for more than 50 years, and and they were the only bank that would even think about loaning money. And it wasn't because of the of the profession that it was in, certainly, okay. but it was because of uh, my dad and the uh, reputation that he built in the community. It was back in those days that a handshake was good enough right. to to uh, get you a loan at the bank, and, uh, and so they believed in me, mm -hmm. and uh, so they loaned me money to buy a race car, and wow. that was unheard of in those days. Right. Now, you've also done announcing as well. How did you kind of transition from being on the... Uh, on the uh, track, track yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. To, to talking about the people on the track. When I drove race cars, the, not many media members attended the races, mm -hmm. and so there's not a lot of coverage. And as a result, the drivers didn't have many opportunities to speak on mm -hmm. their feet or to the media, uh, and certainly not on camera. Mm -hmm. And after I won the championship in 1961, I was not prepared to represent my sport and my family the way that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so I saw an advertisement for the Dale Carnegie course. Oh, and yeah. I took the Dale oh, wow. Carnegie course and uh, it had a dramatic effect on me. Mm -hmm. I was one of these guys that would, you know, if I was talking to you, I'd look down at the floor and maybe mm -hmm. raise my eyebrows mm -hmm. every once in a while. But uh, once you go through that course, you know, you want to tell the world uh, everything right. that my you husband know. Did the Dale and, yeah, uh, I've done it too. And so it got a lot of attention in the sport with the few media people who were covering the sport and said, hey, here's somebody that uh, can talk a little bit and wants to talk. Mm -hmm. And so they sought me out for interviews. And then when I retired from driving, I was asked to sit in on some radio broadcast of the races mm -hmm. and eventually it led to a television career as well it was a long right. process it didn't just come overnight yeah but, uh, and how many years did you do that i i broadcast uh 
I worked for CBS for 22 years, wow. uh, starting with the 1979 Daytona 500. That was the first 500-mile race that was televised live, start to finish. Wow. And uh, so I stayed with them until they lost the broadcast rights after the wow. 2000 season. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I had signed on with ESPN as well, and that was before uh, ABC bought ESPN, uh, okay. so I could work for both so networks. Yeah. yeah. 